Okay, so let's go through these. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the most abundant. This is actually what makes up about 30% of our body weight. Okay, roughly 30% of the body weight, just FYI. And so these, of course, would be all of our skeletal muscles. They're called skeletal muscles because they're attached to the bones of the skeleton. And this is the only one of the three types that is voluntary. Woo! Okay, so because the cells in skeletal muscle tissue are long, like for instance, in most of our muscles, each cell is as long as the muscle is. So these are very long cells. They are also called fibers. So you can use these terms interchangeably, okay? A muscle cell is a muscle fiber. When you look at this type of tissue in a microscope, you will see these little stripes, what look like little stripes. These are called striations. So this is actually another name for this tissue. You can call skeletal muscle striated muscle. It's another name for it. Either name is fine. Okay, the cells are cylindrical in shape like little ropes. And they are long and parallel. They do not branch. So they're all lined up parallel to each other. Okay, each cell will have many nuclei. So we say they are multinucleated. This is a very easy tissue to identify. It does not look like anything else. Now, even though we can control this muscle voluntarily, does it ever contract involuntarily? Yes, it does, all the time, right? Anytime we swallow or cough, sneeze, hiccup, vomit, um, shiver, these are all involuntary contractions, but we can control this muscle voluntarily, right? We can choose when we want to swallow and we can sometimes override those reflexes if we really want to. Okay, so let's take a look at this tissue. This is actually a good picture, although it is kind of a narrow section of it. We don't see much of these fibers, but these are skeletal muscle fibers or cells. Remember, each one of these is called a fiber or cell. Okay, you can use either name. And if you could see these a little bit, you know, a little bit more of this, you would see these, you know, extend out further. And these are the striations. These would run all the way down the length of the cells. Okay, and notice again, many nuclei per cell. The nuclei sometimes look like they're between cells, but actually they're just inside the cell membrane, like just under the cell membrane. And you will see these striations, you will have no problem seeing them, and they are just referred to as striations, okay? <coughs> okay, so that is skeletal muscle, huh? Striations are the individual... The little, what look like little stripes. Yeah. yeah. And then all together they make up the cell. Yes, exactly. Do you guys have any other questions on any of that? Okay, we're gonna be coming back to this type of muscle because this is what we're going to focus on for this unit, but let's just do kind of an introduction to the other two types. Okay, so next is smooth muscle. This is actually a really common type of muscle in the body. You can think of this as being wherever we have movement that we cannot control voluntarily, except for the heart, because the heart has its own type of muscle. So if you think about wherever there is movement, that we can't control voluntarily. Notice we have a bunch of this in the body. Okay, hollow organs would be organs like the stomach, the intestines, the urinary bladder, the gallbladder, the uterus, any type of tube-like structure like bronchial passageways. This is the muscle that contracts during an asthma attack. Um, 
uterine tubes, tubes that carry sperm in the male reproductive system, tubes that carry urine, anything that has to carry or hold a substance is going to have smooth muscle in its wall to move that substance along. Okay, you guys remember rectal pili muscles? They are this type of tissue. We have this in the eye. This is what controls the size of the pupil and the shape of the lens. The walls of blood vessels. This is the muscle that controls where the blood is traveling. Also helps to control blood pressure. So we have a bunch of this in the body. Okay, now this is called smooth because the cells do not have the striations. You will not see striations here. Of course, involuntary. And these cells just have one nucleus per cell. They are described as being fusiform, which means that they come to a point. So they're kind of thicker in the center. They have a long oval nucleus and again, come to a point. So this is called a fusiform shape, also described as being spindle shape cells. And these cells are also called fibers. Okay, so you can call this a smooth muscle cell or a smooth muscle fiber. Now, when you see this tissue in the slides, you will usually not be able to see the shape of the cells because the cells will be all lined up right next to each other. They're just gonna kind of blend in with each other. This tissue actually looks very much like dense, regular connective tissue. They are the two tissues that look more alike than anything else, okay? So let's take a look at this. This is a good picture of smooth muscle. This is from the wall of an organ. You can see the shape of the cells if you look at the drawing here, but notice in this photograph, you really cannot see the individual cells. Kind of looks like dense regular tissue. Okay, now remember you guys, when we're talking about tissues, you can always go back to chapter four and look at another photograph of these tissues and read the description of them, okay? Because this chapter, I think, just shows you small pictures of these. And of course, you can always look them up online and look at some more pictures. Okay, do you guys have any questions on that? Okay, so you can see this looks very different from skeletal. Okay, and then the last type of muscle tissue is cardiac. Okay, so the name tells you this is only located in the heart. heart. And it is also referred to as myocardium. The cardium refers to the heart, like cardiac. Myo refers to muscle. Whenever you see the prefix myo, this always refers to muscle. Okay, so this type of tissue also happens to be striated. You cannot call this striated muscle though, because remember that's another name for skeletal muscle. Okay, of course, involuntary. They cannot control the contraction of the heart, which is a good thing, right? We don't have to think about making the heart contract. Um, mononucleated cells, now these cells are short, so they are not referred to as fibers. A whole chain of these connected end to end makes up a fiber. Another thing that's unique about this tissue is that the cells are connected end to end by these special junctions called intercalated discs. So this will give you a clue that you are looking at cardiac muscle when you see these. I will have you identify them in the tissue. And what these actually are, if you remember when we talked about cell junctions, these are gap junctions. Do you guys remember gap junctions are the ones that have the little channels that allow ions to go from cell to cell. Ions are atoms that have an electrical charge. And this is actually what sends the electrical signal that causes this, the muscle to contract. So muscle tissue contracts because the cells can send these electrical signals and the electrical current is actually what causes contraction. So this is very important to the function of cardiac muscle. Okay, so let's take a look at this tissue. And I'd like to draw this just so you kind of get an idea of what the, you know, the tissue looks like. Because sometimes, in, you know, looking at one picture in the book, you can't really see it that well. And 
I think it's kind of helpful to have another kind of view of it. So this is kind of what the cardiac muscle cells will look like. This is one cell. So remember, you cannot refer to these as fibers because they're not used, those terms are not used interchangeably with this kind of tissue. You'll see very, very faint striations in this tissue. They're not quite as clear as in skeletal. And these heavier lines that are between the cells are the intercalated discs. Okay, those special gap junctions. So that will kind of give you a clue that you're looking at cardiac muscle. So um, you can see here how this tissue doesn't look quite as nice and neat as skeletal muscle or smooth muscle. It looks a little bit messier. It almost looks like skeletal muscle that's been chopped up because the cells drench. And so usually you'll see what looks like spaces between the cells. The cells branch. They actually will split. Okay, so let's take a look at a picture of this. And you can see here in this picture that's in your book, it doesn't really have that kind of messy appearance so much, but they're just showing you a little section of it. You can see the intercalated discs. Notice that the striations are not very clear. It, it's very kind of, um, they're kind of subtle in cardiac muscle. But you can see intercalated discs, so that will help you identify that as cardiac. Okay. So as far as smooth and cardiac muscle go, that's all you need to know about them for now. We are not going to be talking about them again in this unit. We're going to focus now on skeletal muscle because, again, skeletal muscle is what makes up the muscular system. When we talk about the muscular system, this is a whole organ system of its own. Okay, so remember, when we say muscular system, we're talking about this guy, right? You guys are already familiar with him. He was on your first test. Okay, so this is the muscular system. It's all of our skeletal muscles. Okay, so uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Before we jump into the muscular system, let's just talk about the characteristics of muscle tissue. And all three types of muscle tissue that we've been talking about have these things in common. Okay, so this is a table that's in chapter 10 that just kind of compares these three types. And so that's a handy, quick reference. Okay, so these are the characteristics of muscle tissue that all three types have in common. So I think the thing that stands out the most with muscle is this property here, okay? I think that's the thing that's the most obvious feature of muscle tissue. As you guys know, muscle tissue is in a category of its own, right? The four categories of tissues are epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. So muscle tissue is very different from anything else in the body. We know that it obviously causes movement. So whether we're talking about smooth or skeletal or cardiac, it causes movement. And so that is what we call contractility, the ability of the cells to contract. Okay, muscle cells contract and they literally shorten when they do this. The cells literally shorten and that is what causes movement. Okay, so now what makes them do this? Well, muscle cells are also unique because they have the ability to conduct electrical current and the electrical current travels along their membrane. The only cells in the body that can do this 
are muscle cells and neurons, right? Nerve cells. So this is a very unique property. Okay, we call this excitability. Okay, so when we say excitability and we're talking about a cell, this means that the cell can conduct electrical current. No, it is the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's conducted in the same way. It's caused by the movement of ions, atoms that have an electrical, electrical charge, across the cell membrane. They just cross over the cell membrane, and this current travels in a kind of a wave-like pattern down the, the cell. It travels along the membrane and goes down the cell, okay, from like point A to point A, <coughs> and then that causes contraction. This electrical current So electrical current actually causes contraction. This electrical current is called the action potential. And you guys might as well learn that term. The action potential. Because we are going to be using that term a lot in the next week or so as we talk about muscle tissue. And then we'll also talk about this a little bit when we talk about neurons. Okay, so another property of muscle cells is that they are designed to stretch out and come back to their original length. We know that they do this all the time, right? Because we can generate you know, contraction in our muscles, whether they are already kind of shortened, like you know, already um, kind of at a shorter length when we start to contract them, or we can conduct uh, or generate uh, force when, we, when the muscle is more elongated or lengthened. It doesn't really matter. So these cells are designed to work at different lengths, right? Muscle tissue is designed to contract whether it's all stretched out or it's at a shorter length. We know that we stretch our muscles all the time. You guys stretch, you know, like before or after exercising. Uh, we are constantly stretching as we move. As these muscles here contract or shorten to cause this movement, what are these muscles doing here? They're lengthening, right? They're stretching. So this happens all the time. Some cells in the body, like neurons, are not designed to be stretched very far. They actually can be damaged by overstretching them, but muscle tissue is not like that. So we call this property extensibility. So muscle cells uh, can be stretched or lengthened beyond what is called their resting length. The resting length of a muscle is just the length the muscle would assume if you just kind of let it go and it will just kind of lay there. And that is what is called the resting length of the muscle. But it can be stretched beyond that without damaging the cells. So when we stretch out the muscle and let it go, it comes back to its resting length. And this is called elasticity. So muscle tissue is similar to like elastic fibers. It can be stretched out and it will come back to its original length. Okay, so the muscle cells, I'm just gonna abbreviate muscle here, return to their resting length following a stretch. The muscle is designed to stretch out, but of course, if we stretch it too far, too suddenly, sometimes when it's kind of not warmed up, then of course it can tear. But it's better at stretching than a lot of our cells, which are, you know, would be damaged. Okay, so these are properties that all three types of muscle have in common. So let's now talk about the muscular system. Do you guys have this? Okay, 
So the muscular system, again, all of our skeletal muscles together have a bunch of functions. I think that, of course, this is the most obvious, right? It's responsible for all of our voluntary movements. Yay, which is important. Things we don't always think about, we have skeletal muscles that are always contracting just to keep us upright. These are actually called postural muscles. So we have some of these, for instance, running along either side of the spine. These are always contracted to keep us upright. And the muscle fibers in those muscles actually take turns contracting so that they don't fatigue. Okay, temperature regulation, something we don't think about very much here because it's usually not cold enough to worry about it too much. But when we're in a really cold climate or for whatever reason you have hypothermia where your body temperature drops, what starts happening to your skeletal muscles? Shivering. Yes, they start contracting uncontrollably sometimes. And this is called shivering, shivering. exactly. So shivering, you know, the contraction of all of our skeletal muscles helps to slow the loss of heat from the body. Or it helps to slow the drop in the body temperature. Let me just say it that way. It helps to slow the drop in the body temperature. Yeah, because muscle contraction itself generates heat. We know that when we are exercising, you start to feel warmer, you start to sweat because the body's trying to cool itself. So muscle contraction generates a lot of heat. Okay, storage and movement of materials. <laughs> this is the book's way of saying that we have sphincter muscles that help to control the excretion of our waste products, right? Like the external urethral sphincter controls urine flow, external anal sphincter controls movement of feces. Okay, so uh, we'll say our sphincters. And these are skeletal muscle, right? The external sphincters are the ones we can control voluntarily. They're skeletal muscle. Sphincters control excretion of wastes. And that's kind of an important thing. Okay, and also skeletal muscles actually help support joints. This is especially important in some joints like the shoulder that is very unstable, easily dislocated. You guys may have heard of the rotator cuff muscles. These are muscles that actually wrap around the shoulder joint to help hold on to the head of the humerus and they help stabilize the joint. So that's a really important function of muscle that we don't always hear about. Something that's important in physical therapy because that's one of the things physical therapists work on is strengthening muscles around joints to help stabilize joints that have been injured. Okay, so there you have it. Important functions of the muscular system. Do you guys have questions on any of these? Yeah, so sphincters, including like the external anal sphincter, external urethral sphincter, control the movement of urine and feces. So that's what I mean by excretion of wastes. And these sphincter muscles are skeletal muscle. So this, you know, this kind of falls under the, this category. It's all, you know, we have different muscles in different areas. If you want to get more specific, like we could say, you know, our facial muscles are important because they help us chew, you know, mastication and also express emotions. So this is just kind of being a little more detailed with some of these muscles, okay? Talking about the elimination of wastes. Do you guys have any other questions on any of this? Okay, so we're gonna take a look at a skeletal muscle, the structure of a skeletal muscle. 
And notice here in this diagram, we have a skeletal muscle. This is the whole thing that has been cut so we can see inside of it. We are gonna talk about these layers of connective tissue that you see here coming around the outside and also you can see them here inside the muscle, all these different layers of connective tissue, okay? So first of all, let's talk about this outermost layer and you'll see these are listed here in the PowerPoint, but I wanna talk about them with the diagram here. So let's talk first about this outermost layer that is called the deep fascia. Okay, so we'll start with the outermost and work our way in. This layer of tissue would actually be just deep to the hypodermis of the skin. Okay, you guys remember the hypodermis of the skin? Well, it's technically the layer under the skin, but the hypodermis is where we have fat and loose connective tissue. And another name for the hypodermis is the superficial fascia. This tissue is just deep to that. And it is a dense irregular connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle. This tissue goes between muscles. It actually can divide up our extremities into what are called compartments. If you've ever heard of that, like in the leg, we have an anterior compartment, lateral compartment, posterior compartment, and they're separated by layers of this tissue. Okay. Now going a little bit deeper, notice there is a layer here, again, surrounding the entire muscle. This is called the epimyceum, okay? Again, myceum, like myo, refers to muscle. Epi means outside of or on top of. This is also dense, irregular connective tissue, okay? So it's the same type of tissue, but it is a thinner layer. still surrounds the entire muscle. Okay, so although it's the same type of tissue technically, it's much thinner. Okay, now inside the muscle, notice we have these cylindrical structures. They're showing one sticking out here. These are called fascicles. Okay, so each of these is a fascicle. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers. So these little pink things here are muscle fibers, also called muscle cells. Okay, so this whole thing is a fascicle. Around the fascicles, you can see we have connective tissue, okay, surrounding them. This layer has, uh, it's actually the same type of tissue, it's dense irregular, but because it's in a different place, it has a different name. It is called the peri. Mycium. Okay, so perimyceum, still dense, irregular, surrounds the uh, fascicles. And again, a fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers. is the tissue that looks white. Yeah, because this is a lot of collagen fibers, so it's going to look whitish. And you know, living tissue, collagen fibers are white. So this is all perimyceum in here, surrounding these fascicles. Each of these bundles of muscle fibers is a fascicle. So the pink things, were you asking about these pink things? No, I, I thought the white was like a light pink. Oh, this? Yeah. Yeah, this is the mm. perimyceum. Yeah, it might look more of a light pink. Up here it looks more white, but yeah, that is the perimyceum. Fascicles are actually what you see when you look at people who are really muscular, you know, like bodybuilders. Um, you can actually see their fascicles and you know, that appearance where it looks like they have, you know, kind of the individual parts of the muscle that you actually see through the skin. Those are fascicles. And there are thousands of fascicles in each muscle. Hmm? Bundles of muscle fibers. Normally, you know, we don't see the fascicles, but um, 
in a really overdeveloped muscle where they don't have much you know, subcutaneous fat, you can see them. Okay, so finally, the last layer of connective tissue is around each individual muscle fiber. So again, this whole thing here is a fascicle sticking out. Notice each of these would be a muscle fiber or muscle cell. So they're showing one muscle fiber sticking out here. Okay, so this thing is a muscle fiber, also called a muscle cell. And they are surrounded by a thinner, more delicate type of tissue. It's actually areolar or loose connective tissue. And that is called the endomycium. Endomycium. Whenever you see the prefix endo, it's referring to the innermost layer. Okay, so I'll write this up here. I know it's hard to see down here. Okay, endomycium. This is areolar or loose connective tissue and it surrounds each individual muscle cell. Remember muscle cells, also called muscle fibers. I just wanna keep saying that so you remember it's the same thing. So in this picture, you guys see that what they're showing you here, this is supposed to be like a, a fascicle kind of blown up, and this is supposed to be one muscle cell or muscle fiber, this thing blown up, okay? And they're showing you those layers of connective tissue around them. Notice that in the muscle, all of these parts of the muscle kind of look alike, right? Yeah, they do because muscle tissue is just like that. It's like smaller and smaller and smaller cylindrical structures. So when you're looking at these diagrams, you wanna just take a few seconds to try to get oriented and figure out what you're looking at, okay? Whether you're looking at the whole muscle or a fascicle or a muscle fiber. Notice that even in the muscle fiber, there are cylindrical units inside the muscle fiber, okay? so. Remember, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller units that kind of look alike. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so what I'd like to do is take a look at a muscle cell or muscle fiber kind of blown up. And we'll take a look at the different parts of it. Okay, I'd like to come back to this stuff a little bit later. So let's skip over this stuff right here and come back to that. Okay, so when we're talking about muscle tissue, we said that myo, the prefix myo, always refers to muscle. But in muscle tissue, there's another common prefix that we will see a lot, and that is sarco. The term sarco literally means flesh. Okay, so when we're talking about the cell membrane of the muscle cell, it is basically like the cell membrane that we've already looked at. You guys drew it, or I think you drew it. We talked about it, right? I drew it. <laughs> it's the phospholipid bilayer with the protein molecules, the cholesterol, all of that stuff. But it has a special name and it's called the sarcolemma. Okay, <clears throat> basically like other cell membranes, but it has a special name. Okay, so this is the cell membrane of a muscle cell. All the stuff inside the muscle cell collectively is cytoplasm, right? You guys know that cytoplasm is all the stuff inside the cell. But in muscle cells, it is called sarcoplasm. Okay, and then we're going to talk about an organelle that is like the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in other cells but it has a special name and is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, abbreviated SR. Okay, so it looks like smooth endoplasmic reticulum and we will talk about what it does. By the way, you guys, we have these 
muscle tissue models I forgot to mention. So what I'd like you to know about these is just what type of muscle tissue it is, okay? You just need to know the type. On cardiac, you should be able to identify intercalated discs. Okay, so you have the three types. Okay, and also you can look up on this slide. <coughs> okay, so taking a look at this diagram, and if you have the fifth edition, the new edition of the book, they changed the diagram just a little bit. It's basically the same as this. I actually like this one better because it, uh, the new one looks a little bit busier, but it's basically the same. Okay, so now notice that this is one individual muscle cell or muscle fiber, right? They have removed the endomycium. The endomycium is not shown here. If it was shown here, it would be outside of this whole thing, right? It'd be outside the whole thing. This thing that they've kind of laid back so you can see inside the cell, this is the cell membrane, the sarcolemma, okay? The cell membrane. So remember we said that the cell membrane has that special name. Okay, so when we look inside the muscle cell, all the stuff inside is sarcoplasm. Okay, which is cytoplasm. Okay, it's all sarcoplasm. And I think the most obvious thing we see here that's different from just kind of the generic cell that we looked at before is we see these cylindrical structures that run the entire length of the muscle cell. These are called myofibrils. Okay, so you don't want to get confused with the terminology here. Myofibrils are these smaller units that are inside the muscle cell or muscle fiber, okay? Myofibril. So these are not the same thing as a myofiber. So you can call this whole thing a muscle fiber, and that's the same thing as saying muscle cell. It's also sometimes called a myo fiber. Okay, these are all the same thing. Myofibrils are inside the myofibers. Okay, notice that the myofibril is actually just like a bundle of these kind of thread-like structures you see sticking out here. These are called myofilaments. Now, obviously for the muscle cell that have so much of this stuff, right? It's just kind of filled with these myofibrils which are all these myofilaments. For the muscle cell to have so much of this, these must be very important for the function of the muscle cell. And as we talk about this, you will see that what happens during contraction is the myofilaments slide across each other. As they slide, it causes the whole cell to shorten or contract. So this is actually what causes muscle contraction. Okay? And if you look at the myofibrils kind of long ways, if you look down the length of the myofibril, notice you see what looks like kind of a pattern in the myofilaments. This is actually what creates the striations that we see in skeletal muscle when we look at it in a microscope. Okay, we'll talk more about that next time. Okay, so let's talk about the blue stuff that we see here that's kind of wrapped around these myofibrils. This is actually the organelle that I was mentioning before that looks like smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So everything you see here in blue is part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay, abbreviated SR. Okay, now notice that um, spaced out every, actually the, in real life, this would be like every few millimeters along the tissue. The sarcoplasmic reticulum has these little sacs. These little sacs are called terminal cisterns. Okay, so sarcoplasmic reticulum is the name of the organelle. It has little sacs called terminal cisterns. Okay, so what do these do? This 
is a really important organelle in muscle tissue. It has a role in muscle contraction. Okay, so the terminal cisterns are like little sacs that store calcium ions. Okay, and an ion is just an atom that has an electrical charge on it. And these hold on to, the little sacs hold on to the calcium ions when the cell is relaxed. Okay, so during relaxation. When the muscle cell contracts, these will release their calcium ions and the calcium will actually cause these myofilaments to slide across each other. Okay, so this is an important part of contraction. If you have not had chemistry, it does not matter. Don't worry about it. But I'm just going to give you the abbreviation for calcium ions so you don't have to write it out every time. Okay, the chemical abbreviation for calcium is big C little a. And when we put calcium atoms in body fluids, they will lose two electrons. So calcium ions have a positive charge of two. So this is the abbreviation for calcium ion. Okay. Okay, so one more thing that you can see here in the muscle cell I'd like to talk about is notice that there is another little system of tubules here shown in green. So the green tubules look like they are between two terminal cisterns and actually they are kind of strategically located there between the terminal cisterns. These are called T-tubules. T stands for transverse. Okay, so transverse or T-tubules. And it's hard to see in the picture, it doesn't really show this very well, but these are actually continuous with the sarcolemma. They're connected to the cell membrane. So T-tubules are really like kind of um, invaginations of the cell membrane where the cell membrane comes down inside the muscle cell. So we said that the action potential, the electrical current, travels along the sarcolemma, right? It goes down the sarcolemma. So because these are con continuous with the sarcolemma, the action potential is going to go down the T-tubules. So, so this electrical current is being carried down inside the muscle cell, okay? So that is what the T-tubules do. the electrical current called the action potential down inside the muscle cell. So they help to get that electrical current inside the cell. And this is really what triggers the whole contraction process. So we said that T-tubules are located between the two terminal cisterns. Okay, so you see that little grouping here. The three structures together is what is called a triad. Okay, because there are three structures. So this would be the two terminal cisterns plus the one T-tubule between them. So when you think about this, based on what we just talked about, you can kind of start putting together the sequence of events that happens in the muscle cell that will cause contraction. We said there's an, an electrical current called an action potential that's going to travel down the sarcolemma. It will also travel down the T-tubules. Because T-tubules are located between the terminal cisterns, what do you think might happen with those terminal cisterns holding all that calcium. It's going to cause some kind of change in the muscle cell, right? 
something is going to happen as a result of this electrical current. And what happens is the little terminal cisterns release their calcium. The calcium will go out into the sarcoplasm, and now it's kind of out there in the sarcoplasm hanging out. It actually is going to bind to these myofilaments. So a chemical bond will happen where calcium binds to the myofilaments that will cause them to slide across each other, which is really what contraction of the cell is. It's the sliding of the myofilaments. So you guys really almost know all the steps in contraction, okay? And next time we will finish that, we'll talk about exactly what happens here with the myofilaments when the calcium is released, okay? So if you have not started reading this, which I know, you know, maybe you have not. I get it. Okay, you wanna start because although this is not a lot of stuff that we have to cover, it's a bit involved. I don't think it's harder than anything else that you know we're gonna be covering in this class. It's really mostly about just the structure of the parts of the muscle, right? So if you think about it, what we've talked about here is the parts of the muscle cell and their basic functions, right? What we do, that is what we do, right? So just ask yourself, okay, sarcoplasmic reticulum has these terminal cisterns, what do they do? They store calcium ions, right? T-tubules, what do they do? They carry the action potential, okay? So as you review the muscle cell, just think about basic functions. That's all we've talked about, okay? Um, so that is basically, basically the structure of the muscle cell. The other stuff you can see here would be a bunch of mitochondria. Makes sense because muscle is such an active tissue. It has a lot of mitochondria. And you can see a bunch of nuclei. We said that these cells are multinucleated, so that's why they show a lot of nuclei. And that's basically it. Okay, so we'll pick up with this next time, and let's go ahead and take a break. When you guys come back, we'll talk about skeletal muscles, okay? So let's come back at 10 to 9, okay, 8.50. If you guys want to see your test, let's do that during lab, okay, so you can take a break.